Thanks very much for the introduction and for having me here at WE380 and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about a topic that's very dear to my heart. For one, the automobile, and second, um, the autonomous car. And, and also third, to do this here at Stanford University, which maybe some of you saw from my bio that was shared in advance of, of this class. I used to run the Center for Automotive Research here on Stanford campus. I still hold a lecturer appointment at the business school. But uh, relax, I will not bore you with all the business jargon and business frameworks and the likes. But I want to share with you a few thoughts on how actually these autonomous vehicles might or might not actually take shape. And therefore, I really want to look at technology, business, consumer, and also policy considerations, because uh, not everything that we can do, we are allowed to do, or maybe we should not do. And therefore, it's, it's really my, my message, basically, when I, when I teach classes, that while technology is great, one also needs to consider business, consumer, policy, and actually environmental considerations as well. And, and so therefore, I, I, I brought a mix. Uh, you also see there uh, the last uh, or the lowest um, line in well, as my title. Um, I'm also a consultant at McKinsey, uh, the um, management consulting firm. So what I'm sharing here with you today is actually business uh, consulting uh, information. And so therefore, there might be a little bit of jargon in there, uh, but I, I really selected uh, this material that I thought might fit equally well in other disciplines as well. So therefore, it's great to be here in EE CS engineering in general and talk about autonomous driving. Are we there yet? And and the way how I um, really like to to begin a talk like this is with this picture that I've or that I used to show quite a bit when when I. Uh, started the Center for Automotive Research here at Stanford in um, ME, actually, in 2009. And we had a class uh, dedicated to autonomous driving. Sebastian Thrun was there lecturing as well, which was really a treat. Uh, Chris Ermsen also came to class to lecture. And um, I was showing them this picture because it's actually from a book that my parents bought around the time when I was born. Uh, late 60s, early 70s, and it was a book about the future. It was about what the future might be, and in the early 70s, the future was, of course, the year 2000. And um, so this is what the idea was in the year uh, 1970, something like this. Um, autonomous cars. Back then, it was much more about automated highways than today's autonomous cars. So it was relying much, much more on infrastructure then actually the self-contained laser scanner, radar, camera, deep learning, and, and all of those things within the car. But the idea was the same. Well, we will have cars to drive themselves, and we can actually enjoy the time in the vehicle, doing other things than driving, have a drink, uh, watch TV. Uh, they hadn't quite figured out that we wouldn't stick to a four by three screen, so they, they were not thinking about 16 by nine, which tells us also something that things in the uh, consumer electronics industry change much, much faster than things in the automotive industry, because here we are. This book basically was printed uh, or published when I was born. Whether I like it or not, I'm somewhat midpoint in my life, I guess. We still don't have it, so it makes me hopeful that there's still a lot for me to see, expect, and explore in the second part of my life. And, um, and, and also what this picture shows, again, it, it's more about automation um, of the highway, and, and therefore this car is actually not driving across the, the center line uh, between the lanes. It's actually a magnetic strip, which they had envisioned back then as a guidance system uh, for those vehicles, which you can basically today replace with GPS, because back then they didn't have GPS. It was in the early stages in the 1970s. But today it's basically something like you know where you are on a road through GPS. Uh, but, but also what this picture shows, it's an idealistic representation of what traffic is. Because that is something that everyone basically is in an autonomous or automated vehicle. They all seem to be following those red dashed lines. But now think about it. If this red car, they are basically in front of uh, our three friends who are enjoying a gin and tonic or something like this, which you then can do while driving. 
Um, imagine this red car is actually hum driven by a human. And it's on 101, and it's maybe me. It's like, ooh, this is the exit to get to campus. And I basically swerve over. Well, first of all, those glasses will no longer be on this little table. But it also tells us actually a lot what the difficulty is and what we are trying to accomplish here, meaning trying to accomplish a world of self-driving cars. But we need to deal with the current system, which is what I like to call a somehow working chaos meaning somehow traffic works out. Uh, but if we now mix autonomous vehicles to it, that should actually follow the rules at all times because it's a vehicle manufacturer who says, this is how I define driving. So therefore, it doesn't really mix too well with us humans cutting corners, literally or figuratively, here and there. And, and therefore, those cars don't really know what to expect. And, and that's, in the end, what, what I really want to explore a little bit more here over the next hour. So the last part of the, of the tagline there, how real is all of it? And basically, what can we expect when um, and, and how might it unfold? But before we go there, maybe a little bit more about the motivation for autonomous vehicles. And, and that basically, I, well, I was way too young then, but one could have shown uh, back in the 1970s um, it's in the end about, about safety, about saving time. It's um, providing mobility to those who don't have mobility today. Reduction of cost always uh, might help as well. And then also what's in it for the greater good of, of society. And, and really personal safety, uh, that also translates actually to the point number five, uh, the interest of society. Today we have 40,000 people killed in traffic accidents in the United States last year. And that's a number that's going up. That's sadly so. It used to be when I was giving similar talks like three, four years ago, this number was 34,000 people killed. Still way too many. But now it's going up from 34,000 to 40,000 people killed. Yes, but before that, though, the number was about 50,000 people. True. It was compared to the number of casualties suffered by the US in the Vietnam War. True. And what caused the 10,000 drop mm -hmm. was the seatbelt law, the requirement to wear seatbelts. Part of it? Which was, no, that was the major portion. Yeah, no, no, well, I mean, it was a huge uh, driver in it, but, but also, for instance, the electronic stability control. So the people or the vehicles cannot spin out anymore. That also saved a lot of lives. And then also incremental change, such as tire pressure monitoring. Also, I will say safer roads really making sure that guardrails don't really stick out of the ground like this and motorcycle drivers really get uh, pinched by them. But definitely seat belts and airbags have also had passive restraints. I mean, the, there were actually passive restraints before airbags because mm -hmm. I got one when I had a Volkswagen Rabbit. Yeah. And they yeah. were the first yeah. to offer passive So it's, it's, it's basically, and I'm a mechanical engineer, it's fair to say that the mechanical engineers probably did a great job making vehicles safer. But in, in the end, it's something that now we are compensating that things got safer and that it got so much smoother in the car that we start texting and maybe playing Pokemon Go and all of these things that we are distracted, and therefore those numbers go up again. Yeah. Stability control was about 20 years after the seatbelt law. Mm -hmm. And with the seatbelts, they saved a lot of people from hitting the dashboard mm -hmm. and impaling themselves, and those deaths went down almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So the point being? No, was he was right on the money over there. Well, yes, but it's not just about seat belts, because even after the seat belts were introduced, still they kept going down. I propose right. to let the speaker continue. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, so, so much about, about safety, and, and the number there that says um, that through autonomous driving that we can maybe reduce those numbers by 90%, which is not quite accurate, because that actually assumes that we can avoid all accidents. What is true is that we can reduce a huge number of accidents, whether that's about 90% or whatever it might be. The problem, however, is there might be new types of accidents as well, which is that now there's computer programming errors, that there's maybe something like the laser scanner was not cleaned uh, before the, the drive started and all of those things. So basically, it's the number of accidents will go down, but also the profile of accidents might shift. Number two is the time that is, that is freed up. Now that we don't need to drive anymore, we can do other things. And, and that is really a huge driver because, especially during commute, people just don't enjoy the driving and are really happy if they can do other things, so if they free up the time. Number three, mobility of non-drivers. So that's really the bookenders of 
the society, if you will. For one, it's really the younger generation, uh, where you say those who are not legally allowed to drive, they can use this in a way as a means of transportation. Or if they are allowed to drive, if they have a driver's permit, maybe this technology or hopefully this technology can help them become better drivers because the vehicle watches out for them, which then obviously becomes a symbiosis, a companionship between the vehicle and the driver, which is the same actually at the other end of the spectrum. So therefore the book enders. So the, the aging population that is maybe not entirely comfortable with driving, but still driving uh, is part of an active lifestyle so that therefore they actually get support first from the vehicle and in the end also the vehicle can drive themselves. So where we say number three, mobility to, to non-drivers or those who otherwise might not have access to mobility. Number four, reduction in cost is on the one hand that the cost per mile might actually go down, especially for mobility services. And I will take a look at this a little bit later. So this is about Uber. If Uber um, operates self-driving vehicles, it's expected that the cost will be cut in half. And, and then um, number five, the benefits for society, where we actually see on, on the one hand congestion really contributes negatively to the GDP in, in a large way, 2 to 4 percent in, in some large cities we basically see is going wasted because people are stuck in traffic. Or some other numbers that are typically or often populated are that the average commuter in the United States loses about 36 hours every year, so almost one entire work week because traffic is not as efficient as it, as it could be. And so therefore, um, if we can do something about this, for one, you gain your, your time, then you can do other things, but also society and economies in general benefit from it. Other than that, uh, under society and, and ecological cost savings, it's about accidents on the one hand, that's definitely a society benefit, but also for the um, ecolog ecological um, aspects where you say, uh, now the traffic is smoother, that you can reduce actually the uh, energy demand for transportation because vehicles are operated uh, more efficiently. So there's a lot of motivation actually to do this. And again, those motivations haven't really changed that much maybe over the last 40 to 50 years. But now this seems to be accelerating. And, and here we basically take a look at like four um, stakeholders in um, autonomous driving, starting from the left. It's really the consumer acceptance is something that we now see growing where people say, yeah, I really want something like this. You see some of the research that we did in, in consulting where you say 79% of consumers who are interviewed would actually choose an autonomous car, especially if it's no extra cost. And you might say, well, duh, that's easy. If it doesn't cost me anything, why would I not do it? But that also implies a different way of driving that you are not in control anymore. And we really have a lot of considerations also in terms of trust. And if you, if you feel comfortable in an autonomous car, if you actually want this, but we see now an increasing number that consumers say, no, that is something actually that I do want to have. Also knowing that it's not an either or. So it doesn't mean if you are in an autonomous car, you can never drive yourself. It's probably going to be something where you can, where you can switch. And, um, and then also 61% say uh, that it should be legalized, which actually tells us already something. It's not necessarily a, um, an automatic thing that as we have an autonomous car, we can also deploy it to the public because the rules that were written for traffic as we know it did not really account for self-driving vehicles. That also brings us to, to governments in general. Uh, so the second from the left. Um, so we, we really expect in, in China, for instance, that already around 2020, quite a few things will happen around autonomous vehicles. And, and it's a pretty interesting thing uh, what regulation is going to be, especially in, in China. For one, you have obviously uh, relatively broadly laid out and, and somewhat strictly organized regulation on a national level, but then you have the individual, individual cities who are really taking action to, to basically get control of, of their traffic in a better way. And therefore, for especially in urban autonomous driving by 2025, that we expect um, to see a lot of autonomous driving there. For the United States, some numbers that we could put in there as well. We will look a um, little bit later at what the adoption curve might look like, but also Actually, the government is pretty favorable in the United States, whether that's on a federal level or 
at least here in California, on a um, state level regarding regulation for autonomous vehicles. So it does not seem to be something where the technology is plowing forward and regulators are trying to catch up, what you see relatively often. So here it really seems to be something that's being developed in um, collaboration. Speaking about collaboration, uh, the third from the left or the second from the right, however you want to look at it, there's now also a lot of partnerships forming in industry, such as Intel, Mobileye, and, and BMW. And this slide was developed before Monday this week when Intel actually announced that they are going to acquire Mobileye. Mobileye is a very innovative company out of Israel. Does a lot of work in computer vision, image processing, learning algorithms, but they don't do their own chips, which Intel obviously does, so that's a very interesting connection there. And BMW, actually my former employer, uh, they have had a partnership with uh, Mobileye and Intel for a couple of years now. So where you see that those partnerships are being formed because it's understood that it's not just a car company does these vehicles, so that you really need a lot of expertise from other fields as well. And just as one example, Valeo, a uh, supplier out of France, is really uh, racing towards laser scanners that you see on all of these autonomous vehicles, laser scanners that you can bring it to production because it's really one thing. Um, I mean, of course, I could show you those videos from all these research vehicles that, that drive around and everything, but that is one thing, but really how do we get this into production? And this is why we really need this, what's happening there in the, again, uh, second uh, column from the right. We really say, how is industry actually preparing for it? And then there's a newcomers uh, to the very right. Uh, Uber, one partnership with, uh, with Volvo, for instance, has a partnership with, um, with Ford as well. So that they are trying out their self-driving vehicles, whether it's in Pittsburgh, they tried it in San Francisco, didn't go very far because of regulation, and then they moved into Arizona. Uh, but really that these newcomers are getting into the scene as well. Same with Baidu and obviously Google or Waymo. Uh, and, and other players. And that's really the interesting thing, that there's so much talent, also so much capital, and so much motivation going into this field. So this is why it's safe to say, um, you mentioned in the introduction, it's, it's five years out, so we shall see what it's going to be in five years, but probably it's not another half of my lifetime until we see something like this. But what do I mean if I say something like this? And therefore it's important to actually look at what autonomous or automated, what actually the technical term is, automated vehicles, what, what this is going to be. So, and here's a definition that's put out from SAE International that has five levels, or if you count level zero as well, six levels of automation, which basically dis uh, distinguishes between what does the human do, so the little figurine there, and what does the system, the car uh, with embedded computer do. And then uh, you can see for yourself uh, by these different columns. So there's for one the primary driving tasks such as steering, acceleration and, and braking. And then there's monitoring of traffic around you. And then it's being available as a fallback if the system cannot do it anymore. And then the last column to the right is actually what is the driving environment or what are the cases where you use this. And no surprise, the higher the level of automation, which is the lower you go on this chart, you basically have more of the computer taking over. We are currently at level two, partial automation, which is basically what a Tesla autopilot is, which basically means the car can drive itself, steering, acceleration, and deceleration. This is what the car does typically pretty well. But the driver is supposed to monitor what's going on so that the driver also can and actually should step in if something goes wrong. And there we had um, incidents with, with Teslas that are relatively well documented. Some of them a little bit more on the public science side of, of the spectrum. But those incidents happened. And they also happen not just because the technology is not perfect. Those incidents actually happen because consumers, drivers, don't really understand or don't really pay attention to the limitations of those systems. Which, for instance, is if there's a truck against the gray sky, that maybe the camera has a hard time seeing really this truck or recognizing that it is a truck, or that if the lane markings on the highway are maybe put out for a certain construction zone, but this construction zone is no longer there, but the lane markings are somehow going into the off, the vehicle might follow those lane markings. This is why the driver has to be there to step in, which means monitoring is required. So big question now is level three, and this is where um, 
researchers also here at Stanford that work with a driving simulator and, and are in the communications and uh, psychology department say level three is really tricky because level three actually means you don't need to monitor anymore, but you need to be there if the system needs you, which basically means I don't understand the lane markings, please take over. Or there might be something like, typically we have a communication network going on here that we know what other vehicles are doing, but communication is off, you have to drive. So basically what you have on, on airplanes with, with autopilot, where it's then something like, okay, in this situation, the pilot needs to take over. And um, the question now there is, and that's a difference actually to airplanes, where you have well-trained professionals who really know what the limitation of the machine is and who are also being told from their employer, you have to be there once you're needed. But you cannot really do this with a normal consumer because you don't really know if the consumer is actually going to follow along. Because it might be if you tell them with level three, you know what, you don't even need to monitor, you can do other things. Other things is actually pretty broad, which might include sleeping or might include like putting your eyeglasses away and you don't find them fast enough if you really need to step in within five seconds, 10 seconds, a minute. And this is what's currently being discussed a lot and what uh, the researchers uh, here at the um, Center for Automotive Research are, are working on a lot. How do you actually get the driver back into the scene and how much time does it take? So some say if you're really blindfolded and, and ears are basically muffled and you take all the blindfold and, and, and um, headset off, that it takes about five seconds that you really understand, okay, we are on a highway, we are on the left lane, we are going at 65 miles an hour, there are other vehicles around us, and we have that distance to the car in front of us. Just explaining it takes more than five seconds. But our brain, within five seconds, basically gets it. But there's also some research that suggests it takes about one minute until you really don't see a difference between someone who was just parachuted into the scene versus someone who has been driving for the last hour or something like this. Because it's also so much context and history of the traffic. We actually know, well, it's going to rain every few minutes at the moment or there's something off with this truck that is there maybe like five car lengths behind me but it's behaving erratically and might mess up traffic. So it's not just what you see right now, there's a lot of context and this is also where we see this context is actually very hard to establish for a computer. Still, uh, level four, uh, high automation, which basically means the car can do everything but it's only some driving modes modes is a little bit misleading. It's not just a driving mode in terms of at what speed and, and uh, at what lateral acceleration you're going. That's also the environment. So mode can be city driving or highway driving or something like this. So basically level four means if the car drive it's, drives itself, it drives itself, but not in every place, not at, at, at all times. Could be that it doesn't work under very bad weather. Could be that it doesn't work on a highway or doesn't work in the city. But this could be something like a robot taxi where you basically say, okay, that works maybe in the city of San Francisco, but you cannot get on the highway to drive down to San Jose, for instance. That would be level four. Only level five is really what we use our cars for today, which basically is we can go wherever we want at a minute's notice, no questions asked, we just drive. So this would be level five if a computer can do that. Um, now, getting a little bit more detailed into when is this going to happen, and, and this is a more conceptual depiction of it and, and like 10 points that um, contribute to it, but I only want to talk about those three steps actually. Today, autonomous vehicles are actually not commercially available uh, to end customers, but there's a lot of testing going on, So, and, and that will definitely continue into the early 2020s and, and this is where we are talking about level four. So level four we might see in the early uh, 2020s in terms of self-driving Ubers that we can really use and, and the likes. And then we will see the early adoption by, by end consumers in the late 2020s, early 2030s, where we say that's now a car that you can purchase. Where you really get a car that can drive itself maybe on the highway but then not in the city. And then uh, broader deployment, uh, we didn't even say 
notice it would, be, would have been easy to put 2040 here, but we really wanted to depict this more at, as the vision. So when we actually will have what the picture from 1970 shows, when we get off the highway and then in the neighborhood streets and all of this and the car can drive itself. So we shall see when, when this might happen. Um, to be a little bit more quantitative, um, here's something where um, we built a lot of statistics and, and, and models around the diffusion curve. And I only want you to pay attention to this uh, solid uh, light blue line as well. I'm happy to talk in overtime about the other lines as well. But that's our most aggressive scenario where we say in 2030 we might have 15, 1.5% of new vehicles globally being self-driving. Level 4, level 5. We think that's fairly optimistic, but we were called pessimists for this as well. So no one really knows what's going to happen over the next 13 years, but it's definitely subject to debate how quickly those vehicles might evolve. Uh, so since we were talking about those self-driving mobility pods, um, self-driving Uber or something like this, it's probably possible in 2030 in a limited environment where you say it works in this city but not in that city. Um, but is that 15% of the global product production? Probably not. So it could be that this is also some sort of technology that gets vehicles on the highway from an on-ramp to an exit, self-driving. But again, because it's level four, then you need to take over at some point again. And then really what it does, uh, 2035 and beyond, it's actually more like to fit a nice curve into this and it would actually be a hard science behind it. Uh, but just understand, five years out, as, as was said in the introduction, um, depends what it is. And this is why I really wanted to share those different levels of automation that, that some of you might be aware of, but I, I always find it very helpful for setting the context. Also for the following, uh, which is if we split this up a little bit more into what are the different flavors of autonomous vehicles, and that's really important to know, there is not just one autonomous car, like today, that's an automobile. I understand this. So here it's something, uh, it's a privately owned vehicle, then it's trucks and the robo-taxi. So the robo-taxi basically a self-driving mobility on demand um, installation. But if we go to the top, um, around now we are, we are launching traffic jam pilot, so level three uh, automation. Remember, this is where the driver does not need to monitor the traffic anymore, but needs to be available if the system cannot take it anymore. There are some, I'm not sure if it's evidence, but suggestion that this fall we will see a vehicle from one particular manufacturer as level three automation. So I'm be, I'd be very curious to see if that's the case, that you can actually put something into the operator's manual and say, you don't have to monitor this vehicle while under auto cruise or whatever you want to call it. Because there's huge implications, obviously, because that is legally binding that you say you don't have to monitor, which basically means you shift liability. And this is something that the automotive industry has really seen in, in a few tragic cases, tragic mostly because people um, died and, and suffered and, and um, personal loss. Also tragic because things were blown up in the media and, and also negative at least because a company's reputation was, was challenged. And um, what, what we just see, it's not so much who's at fault in a certain case where you say this is a liability. It's also this car company uh, basically did this and therefore um, the reputation might get tarnished quite a bit. So therefore putting something out where you say this is level three, that will be a big step. Uh, you can see for yourself um, still on the top row, uh, highway pilot level three, maybe level four, where you don't even need to be available as a uh, fallback scenario. Somewhat in the uh, mid um, 2020s uh, possible and then going along, but level five, we don't really know when this might happen. And that applies for all other um, examples as well for the trucks and the robo taxi as well. For trucks, there's definitely a very interesting thing, platooning, which is also what some uh, Stanford graduates are working on. Peloton, just down the road in Menlo Park, they're working on platooning <coughs> trucks uh, that you can do different things. For one, if you don't need 
the additional driver, that's great. That's not their primary focus as much as I understand, but really to make driving safer, that you have those vehicles following closely along with a lot of computer help, but also that you take advantage of um, aerodynamic drag, which basically means if those vehicles are spaced closer together, you can save up to 20% of fuel consumption because the aerodynamic resistance is significantly lower with those vehicles. So that might happen relatively soon, 2020 um, possible, but then it also becomes something, well, platoons are great, but how do passenger vehicles merge uh, between those trucks and how long are those platoons going to be and which states are going to allow them. And also actually we talk in business jargon a lot about customer or consumer acceptance. It's also something that truck drivers are very proud um, part of society. They, they really cherish their trucks and, and how big of a thing it is to manual sh manually shift those trucks. I actually tried it to, to shift a, a class A truck I could not do it. Even as a mechanical engineer uh, from Germany, I could not shift this thing. And, but they can, and they take a lot of pride in it. And now you say, well, now you don't need to do the driving anymore. The computer does it for you. So this is where we shall see consumer acceptance also plays a big role. Anyway, high uh, highway pilot, somewhat similar to the passenger vehicles as well. Level five, uh, really everybody's guess. Robotaxi, um, the what it says here, 2022, 20, something like this, in confined urban areas. This is really at larger scale where you say now it's a real product and not just like, yeah, you can use this self-driving mobility service, but there's still a human driver uh, behind the wheel for testing and, and also safety purposes. Uh, but if this really becomes uh, like a real service without any driver, that in 20. 22, um, still slightly aggressive, I think. And then really the uh, service area growing, uh, that will take a long time because you don't really know where those vehicles might be going. And so therefore, uh, much needs to happen. And there we depicted like 10 years in between, uh, who knows. Are, are you gonna make a distinction with fleet vehicles, by the way? Um, well, if you, if you look at it, uh, the. Lower two, obviously, centrally fleet-operated vehicles. So trucks, for sure, but, but also those robo-taxis. And that definitely comes with um, quite a few implications on itself. For one, um, because fleets uh, have a much, much closer attention on operating costs. And what we said earlier, uh, there's quite a bit in that a um, private uh, owner of a vehicle might be a penny pinching, but in the end doesn't really think that much about how much driving really costs. And so therefore for fleets, then there might definitely be something. And also for fleets, uh, they are professionally uh, maintenanced and serviced. And again, also the driver, operator, whatever then the, uh, a proper um, uh, description might be, you can tell them this is a situation you can use it in, but this is a situation you cannot use it in. So yes. Um, in, in this, also, who's doing what? And, and it's actually quite interesting if you want to um, separate it out into the incumbents or basically the established automotive industry and, and then uh, the newcomers um, like IT companies, Uber, Baidu, Google and the likes you can read for yourself. And it seems like that the established automotive industry, including Tesla, is really more on an evolutionary path. So that there we say, yes, now we are at level two, next is level three, level four, eventually level five. Whereas the newcomers or the IT players basically say, well, this level two, level three, that's not really what we do. We just leapfrog to level four, which basically is the car drives itself under all situations, doesn't need any human backup but it's in a confined area, maybe just, just in one city. And so therefore, we also put a price tag to it. If you, if you sell those vehicles as an evolutionary scenario, if you sell those to um, end consumers, you cannot really charge too much for it, which again, to the point, um, also relates to um, it's a centrally operated fleets, where you might say if it's individual consumers, $1,500, $3,000 maybe for level two, level three, for level four, if you don't really need to do any of the driving on the highway, so if you commute 
um, on 101, let's say from Morgan Hill here to Stanford, and you really don't need to drive at all, there might be quite a few people who say, okay, that's worth an extra $10,000. So this is at least what we see in consumer surveys, that you see a relatively steep drop off at $10,000 that um, the willingness to pay then decreases, which is why level four, level five uh, probably needs to be within uh, this uh, ballpark. Now, what are really all the different use cases and what are the ones we should pay attention to? And I'm, I don't uh, suspect or don't suggest that we should read all of this, but uh, it, it's on the one hand really here at the bottom where the driver is optional, which is really what those players um, from the tech industry are pursuing. And this is largely the robo-taxi of, of vehicle on demand, uh, where there you can see how many kilometers uh, per day and per person and how, what's the percentage of the, of the average driving. So that's a little bit more the consulting uh, view of the world. But also for the top part, driver required, which is what the traditional car companies are working on, where probably the most likely first implementations are traffic jam pilot and a, and a highway pilot. Highway because you don't have traffic lights, you should not at least have kids at play, you don't have cross traffic, so it's a much more uh, well-organized um, environment on a highway than you have in the city. Granted, you move at higher speeds and therefore things can happen more quickly than in the city, but overall, probably a setting on the highway is more predictable and if you have fast sensing and communication technology, uh, probably more doable for um, autonomous driving or some level of automation. Now, why all this talk about this uh, robo-taxi or uh, automated mobility on demand? And, and here's a, a chart. Um, just um, want to direct your attention to uh, three lines. Uh, which is the dashed lines, which is basically how much does it cost depending on how many miles, I think it's in kilometers, yeah, it's a metric chart, how many kilometers you drive per year. And you basically see the, the purple line, uh, which is vehicle ownership, which is interesting because even if you don't drive, it costs you a lot of money. And that's, again, the thing would never work for a business entity to do anything like costs you a lot even if you're not using it. But for us as consumers, we're okay with it. Because on the other hand, we say, well, you know what, if, if I drive a little bit more, it doesn't really cost me more. I have the car already. I might as well drive on the weekend to the, to the ocean. Or you know what, I just go to the grocery store because I forgot milk. It doesn't cost me much. And that's really a lot in this um, purple line, which is really the freedom, the independence, what a car is today. We make an investment, and then we say, now I can use it. Whereas for uh, shared mobility, uh, so the dark blue and, and red line, which is um, shared, um, shared vehicles, uh, the, the red line is for an autonomous driving, and uh, the blue line would be like an Uber or Lyft equivalent today. It obviously doesn't cost you anything if you're not using it because it's not an annual membership fee or something like this. But then once you use it, you obviously need to somehow um, uh, prorate the operating cost of those vehicles and insurance and whatnot. So therefore, this line is much, much steeper. And you see basically today, it would be something if you don't have self-driving cars that around 6,000 miles or roughly um, about 4,000 sorry, 6,000 kilometers, about 4,000 miles, something like this, that you actually see until then, if you just get your, your right uh, sharing service, it's cheaper. Uh, beyond that, it's actually cheaper to, to use uh, your own vehicle. Question? Uh, so far, you're, you've been talking about predictions and time frames and decades and so forth. Are you going to be able to get into the technology of what yeah. are the limiting issues and why mm -hmm. we're not there yet, and are we there yet, yeah. and what will happen yeah. first? Getting that, for sure, yeah. The vast majority of uh, passenger cars are idle most of the time. Yeah. And so when does, when do these technologies begin to interact with the idleness of vehicles and the ability to start capitalizing on all that idle? Mm -hmm. You know, private ownership vehicles, which is public, et cetera. Yeah. When does, when does the AD actually, at what level does the AD have to get to before it really has an impact? 
Well, I mean, it's fair, fair question. I mean, this autonomous driving in itself actually change much if it's a shared vehicle or not. Uh, for one, the dash, or at least the blue and the red line here, that's a shared vehicle, should be therefore idling much less. But if I have a personally owned vehicle and it happens to be self-driving, therefore it's not automatically a shared vehicle. Uh, we did do some calculations where we basically said, well, if it's a self-driving car, it costs you so much more because there's more technology in it and so on, but you can differentiate that cost by actually sharing it with others then you, you see basically that obviously the cost of ownership drops significantly. But basically the answer to this is it, it's twofold. For one, when is the technology ready, which we saw on some of the, the previous pages. Uh, but then also when are people willing to share their vehicle with others or basically see it as a, as a business asset where they say that's not really my car that I enjoy as a, as a personal piece. It's much more a business instrument that I put out there on, on a market and everyone else can use it. So it really comes in, in both ways. And um, there's not really a time stamp on this where we could say, and I'm making this up, in 2028, technology might be ready to, to do this and consumers are ready to, to share their vehicle. It's really those two aspects of it. Um, okay, so, so the point in this is that once we have self-driving um, shared vehicles, then it's up to 20,000 kilometers where you actually see that using a shared vehicle is cheaper than owning a car. And this is actually why obviously Uber and Lyft and the likes are really pursuing self-driving cars uh, at a larger scale. Now, to your question, what's holding us back? And, and that's really different things. It's technology, consumer acceptance, which we discussed already a bit, uh, but also law and, and regulation. Um, combined. And in, in technology, it's, it's not trivial. For one, it's really to come up with a fail-safe system that you can really say, this is not something we give to consumers. It's not trained professionals. It's not people who get a certain certification to operate those vehicles. It's really everyone who gets in this car and must understand what it is. And therefore, the fail-safe uh, design of those vehicles is, is really a huge challenge and that probably will take quite some time not just in terms of developing the technology but also getting consumers understand what the limitations are and actually learning how consumers interact with it and therefore tragic events that we had with uh, level 2 automation from, from some manufacturers that's also how industry learns how to make it, make it better. Uh, then an adequate degree of system redundancy it's basically that, um, obviously somewhat similar to airplanes, but on a somewhat different level, that cars need to be redundant as well. Brakes, for instance, have triple redundancy. Uh, the steering column or the steering system is designed such that it can actually never fail. Never say never, but they basically run all the cycles and say, no, that's a low enough uh, ratio that the system can fail. And you need to establish this for the autonomous drive system as well. And therefore, it's nice if you can come up with something. We did this drive and it was 99% autonomous. But 99% is probably not enough for a consumer vehicle because that basically means that you have some sort of an incident every 100 miles. And then the question is what this incident might be, which again, the solution might be that it's a level three where then every 100 miles you tell driver has to take over. But also definitely cybersecurity uh, because probably those vehicles need to be connected and so therefore um, it opens up an, an entry point for threats and um, how can you deal with this. This is where I'm personally torn where I don't really know if this topic is rather overhyped or if it's underestimated and maybe the truth is somewhat in between. It's definitely something that the car industry uh, recognizes that they need to brush up on their cybersecurity defense skills and this is why they are hiring uh, computer scientists or at least trying to hire a computer scientists to really make sure that the vulnerability goes down as much as possible. Uh, on the consumer acceptance, let, let me be, be quick on those, but, but it's really the Hindenburg moment is, is mentioned there, so if one incident can really spoil the entire field because then it becomes something, oh, this happened, 
like last year, and the industry is not ready to deploy those vehicles. So this can have a pretty long history. The consumers then just don't trust those vehicles. But trust, uh, which is also the lowest bullet point on the consumer acceptance, is really important because for one is, is it safe and do you trust the safety? But then it's also something, do you trust how the vehicle drives? And this is where there's a lot of research here happening at Stanford as well. How do you communicate actually with a vehicle? How do you understand what it does? Because if a vehicle, self-driving vehicle, slows down, you might be nervous, like, why are we slowing down? What, what's happening here? Am I supposed to do anything? And therefore, the vehicle needs to communicate to you probably what is going on in a certain situation. And that is, again, something much beyond technology, which obviously goes into uh, psychology and communications and such, uh, to actually say, this is how we interact with this uh, technology, and therefore consumer acceptance really is um, very important here. And unclear to what extent consumers understand already today what an autonomous car is, where we as um, engineers, as programmers, as, as business strategists, don't really have an absolute clear understanding what is going to happen when, which we probably saw on those curves. Uh, law and regulation, let me also be relatively brief about this. I, I have a little bit more detail about this coming up. Uh, but it's, it's on the one hand that it's not a clear scenario what is allowed where. Uh, so in the United States, for instance, it's pretty interesting that vehicles are being regulated on a federal level. So it's a federal motor vehicle safety standard. FMVSS that basically regulates that cars uh, must have crumble zones and must have a bumper at a certain height and that seat belts need to be installed and, and, and airbags and, 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 and whatnot. But drivers are regulated on a state level. You get your driver's license from the state of California or state of Michigan, what have you. Now, what is a self-driving car? And who regulates this? And, and this is where some states plowed forward. Um, Nevada was... Again, I think the first in the United States in 2010, 2011, basically plowing forward and putting out regulation for self-driving vehicles. Then other states, um, California, Florida, and a few others uh, following. And then at some point on the federal level, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, saying, we don't like this, that states are doing their own regulation in this. And now last fall, they implemented 15 guidelines for autonomous vehicles, which were basically received very, very positively by, by, by the states, but also by uh, researchers, industries, and the likes. So it, it's really something, what I meant with this example, what's happening on a federal level regarding the regulation of the vehicle and what's happening on a state level regarding the regulation of the drivers. What does it mean for a driverless car? And in, in some countries, it's um, simply not legal to take your hands off the steering wheel. It just isn't, Germany being one of them, my home country. And so therefore, what do you mean? I have a self-driving car, but I need to grab the steering wheel. And then how do you define this? If it's this level or that level, then you need to or need not to. And then how do you make sure if you switch from one level to another, uh, which is uh, those of you who have driven the Tesla Model S, which is a fantastic car, but also through the learning that, that they have gained from um, obviously a lot of consumer miles that, that they could then analyze to start out with something, not much warning to the driver if the driver was not uh, engaged to now warnings if you don't touch the steering wheel every 10 seconds or something like this, you get a warning or the system might shut itself off and can only be re-engaged if you come to a full stop, which then is really annoying, especially on a highway. So this is where we see what, what regulation is one, but also where industry is really trying to implement and actually interpret this regulation. But getting to technology, so what is needed to make all this work? On the previous page, we said um, technology is, is there, but, but really we might need much, much more. And if we go in, in this, it's actually not quite an octopus, but, but if we go from the, the 12 o'clock uh, mark there and, and just go around the circle and discuss maybe a little bit what is needed and what do we have already. And in no particular order, therefore, other than uh, the um, uh, clockwise orientation. Big data analytics. So those vehicles will collect a lot of data. And this data is needed to understand what driving and especially what an autonomous vehicle actually means. And, and that means as a whole that this data 
should be analyzed, like this is what traffic looks like, but also to understand actually what is it that this laser scanner or camera is looking at. And that might not be so trivial because for one you can say, yes, this looks like a truck, but also what is this truck doing? So the context actually matters a lot. Say, say it again. So if Amazon crashes next time, everybody's going to be late for work that morning? No, they'll be dead. <laughs> um, if Amazon crashes, help me out with this example. It's possible? Oh, a a AWS. AWS. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's possible, but must not be, right? I mean, let's, let's put it this way. We, we obviously do have these scenarios that uh, air traffic gets messed up if there's a server outage or something like this. And something similar is possible as we are talking about highly automated and connected vehicles connected to um, number two, which is data cloud. If that's not available, that uh, we have a problem. The fallback scenario then is that the driver steps in and we can drive ourselves. Question is, are we still good enough to drive? But these are like the long-term implications, but definitely those are also things what I meant earlier, the number of accidents probably goes down, but it might shift because those things can happen which wouldn't have an implication or an impact today. Um, so much about the, the data cloud, so where you share all this data and where, where you um, uh, have a centralized uh, place for it. At the software platform, there's a lot of talk if maybe Google or Waymo, for, for that matter, has the operating system for the self-driving car, which is then very similar to, to Android in a way that, like, however many, 70% of all smartphones run Android, that maybe 70% of all automated vehicles run one particular operating system. It's possible, but there's also pretty interesting to note that the automotive industry is relatively defensive and relatively alpha. Um, person environment where they might say, yeah, but we, we don't want this. We rather want uh, our own software. High definition maps is a very important part. Um, for one, you obviously want to know where you are on the road, but even much more, what does the road look like and what should you be watching out for? And also that you can actually detect certain structures on the road and therefore that helps you with the positioning uh, relatively to the um, setting of the road or, or of the city you might be driving in. Some people say you have to be able to do it without high definition maps. Some say it won't work without. So, so there's a lot of discussion going on in this. And the driver of this discussion might be that when can we reliably say that we have these high definition maps where you can come up with a great map if you do a demo, let's say in the city of Mountain View and you can show the car can drive itself and that's all fantastic. But when can you really say that there's a map that has the same quality, the same level of depth, and that can take you to San Francisco, to Marin County, uh, to Eugene, and beyond? And, and then also, who updates uh, those maps and keeps them accurate over time? So if there's a detour, or if there's an inaccuracy on the map, and then it's one thing if a computer server crashes, but if the map is not accurate and therefore things happen, how much can you rely on it? So there's definitely both camps that say it won't work without maps or we must not uh, rely on, on maps. Um, then the part in the, in the center is actually what the vehicle would do itself, which is all about the perception, the planning and the execution of the driving task. But that's only really what's on the vehicle, the surroundings in, in order to go forward here. High resolution positioning um, at, the, at the very bottom of this circle. It's really something where you need to say, yes, it's important to know that you are on, on 101, but it's also very important to know which lane you are in, let's say if you're on El Camino Real, because it does matter which lane you are in, so therefore you know that's a left turn allowed or not, and you need to pay attention to this traffic light or not, depending on which, which lane you are in. And then also exactly where are you in this lane, which you would do with cameras and lasers and the likes that you don't really um, uh, gravitate out of the lane, but also with additional GPS-assisted um, system. Might make it even better. Smart road infrastructure, talked about traffic lights already. Um, it's nice if your camera system can pick up a red light, uh, but cameras might get confused because especially during ho holiday seasons, there might be a lot of red lights out there. So if the traffic light can send a signal with time and phase, that would be great. However, then it's also something, at what point can you rely on it that wherever you drive, the traffic lights actually transmit time and phase? 
And this is something what we've seen from vehicle communication um, technologies that it's really taking a long time uh, until you can get everyone um, agree on a certain standard that you can use. Gets us to V2X communication. There's also something similar to maps, where maps, some people say it will not work without, or we cannot wait until we have it. Same with vehicle to X infrastructure or vehicle to vehicle communication. Some say, and I happen to be one of them, you have to have some sort of communication between those vehicles because otherwise you cannot really coordinate those self-driving vehicles. Others then say they will take way too long. We cannot wait that long. It has to work without. Thoughts on this? Um, excuse me for playing devil's advocate. It's fine. Every time I hear something like this or see a slide like this, it, I, it's very disheartening because your premise is that if the driving is done with certain features, then you need to have certain support for those features. But everybody in this room with a driver's license is an existence proof that no, you don't need any of those things. <laughs> I don't need big data analysis. I don't need a data cloud. I don't need communications. I don't need mm -hmm. to be knowing what, who the other cars are. A, a person with vision and a sufficiently smart brain yep. can drive a car with none of the things that you say are required technologies. Um, yes and no. I mean, some of them actually we can do very well as, as humans, which obviously is to see traffic lights or positioning system within a lane is, is actually pretty good. Uh, V2X, I, I have something coming up actually, which is eye contact to other drivers, um, seeing other vehicles that works relatively well. On the big data and, uh, analytics, data cloud and software platform, Agree, we don't have this as human drivers today. But this is also where I say that humans and computers are very different, obviously. But it, it's really hard to tell who's, who's better at executing a certain task, namely driving a car. Computer obviously is very good to do something incredibly fast with very high accuracy, but typically very repeatedly uh, so, if it's pre-programmed to do it. Whereas a human is actually very good to have some sort of intuition and pattern recognition and, and, and actually figure things out with creativity. And the creativity is typically what makes us a good driver, can also make us a bad driver if we get too creative within the car. But it's actually something, if there's a situation that we don't quite know, we would slow down a little bit once we actually recognize something or we maybe see what other people are doing. Everyone else is slowing down as well. So it might be that it's not just a plastic bag there in front of us. It might be, I don't know, a sofa or something like that. And um, that is something where the data cloud probably would provide the context that humans have today in terms of this is what the situation looks like, especially from all our learning uh, that, that, that we have, because one says that it takes about seven years for a student driver to get to a level where you really have the, the, uh, the thinking and the um, experience set that makes you a relatively good driver. Where you can maintain, well sure, then let's do deep learning for, for those vehicles. But it's really hard to train those deep learning algorithms, what they're actually supposed to learn. It's one thing that you have them learn, this is a car, this is a truck, this is a bicyclist. But it's really to learn a situation that is, that is very different. And this is where the creativity comes in. And this is why I think like a data cloud where you say, all the vehicles put something on the data cloud and say, this is what I'm experiencing. I have an ABS um, incident where usually I won't. And if like enough vehicles are putting this on data cloud, then the other vehicle might get a message, watch out, it might be icy. Don't exclude the possibility that the autonomous drivers might be several times as good as we are, with the resulting several times the throughput in a lane or on a road. Mm -hmm. And that might come about by some of this extra functionality. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I agree that it would be useful to have additional input. The more sensing mechanisms you have, the more modalities, the better, perhaps. But my claim or my... It's not necessary. It is go five times as fast. I don't think anyone suggesting self-driving cars will go five times as fast. You don't exclude it. It would be useful. But I think the main point is do we have to rely on those systems like the gentleman mentioned before AWS is down for hours the whole world chaos. That's not acceptable. Yeah, I mean, I mean on, on, on this slide here, um, all of it would be helpful. But it's understood that not everything will be available. 
at least not in a in, in, um, sufficient way that you can really rely on it. So, so therefore, it's probably different pieces where once it's available, you're going to use it. And if it's not available, you might go down from one level of automation to another, to a lower level of automation. So, Blair, if we uh, that gentleman's question is, uh, is there a way we take this instead of saying, like uh, we beef up the computing power of the car, the, computing, the car is big enough to carry a big server, I mean, Mm -hmm. as itself. So do we have to constantly communicate with all those clouds, yeah. the data, or, I mean, if you make it smart enough in the local server inside of the car, mm -hmm. so, like, at least in the first uh, stage, it will be good enough. Yeah. At least the driving inside the Stanford campus, yeah. I mean, if we don't go out. It, it depends who you ask. If you ask me, I'm going to tell you you need connectivity. It's not going to work without. If you ask other very smart people, much smarter than me, who are actually working on this day to day, quite a few of them suggest, no, you cannot really wait for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. It has to work without. The reason why I say that, that we need vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication is, is this. And that is largely because we are not going to operate those autonomous vehicles in an ideal world, not in a vacuum where they are just autonomous cars. If they're only autonomous cars, it becomes very predictable because everyone is following the rules. There might be no bicyclists or, or something similar. But all these things are out there, and maybe the bicyclist needs a transponder so that actually the autonomous cars knows there's a, there's a bicyclist, maybe pedestrians as well. There's quite some research, actually, that the cell phones that we are carrying with us, actually the car can pick up a signal like there's a blind spot where a, a, a pedestrian might step on, on the road. And so I say uh, today's vehicles are actually connected because humans are in there. So basically the, the operating system of, a, of today's cars, they are connected because we are humans. And crossing a crosswalk without making eye contact with a driver feels pretty scary. And also actually changing lanes and you basically just know that the other driver is doing something like this and changing lanes feels also awkward. So therefore, vehicles are connected today, and this is why the third bullet point, we really need to, in my mind, this is my opinion, we need to talk much more about the collaborative automation than we can talk about autonomous, which is a self-contained, completely independent, which in a way is a definition of autonomous system. That's, that's my two cents. Again, there, there are other researchers, certainly in, in this building as well, and at least I, I know the, the team that was working on the DARPA grant and urban challenge about 10 years ago, they tend to say that communication is probably not necessary. Uh, my understanding is that they're also saying this because it will not be available soon enough. So if you put something like bringing out a infrastructure that's always available, and if you overlay this with these S-curves that I put up, it might not match. So therefore, you might need to be able to start in this vacuum, but this is what I then maintain. This vacuum might be that you only do it in the city of Mountain View. And that there actually you bring out a few Wi-Fi hotspots that then actually at least connect those vehicles to a centralized server. But there you have it, uh, that then those vehicles are connected. And I'm actually surprised how, how often I get comments like, no, it, it's going to work without connectivity. Well, we are connecting each and everything today. Every computer, every phone, more and more watches, even refrigerators we are connecting. But with this we say cars don't need to be connected. I, I have a hard time grasping this. Well, humans are connected. Yeah. Yeah. But the business is kind of local. I mean, I, I don't mind if you, you connect with the cars are surrounding you right now, but you don't have to really go into Amazon. Well, that, that remains to be seen. If it's, if it's a centralized server or, or something different. So there, there's two school of thoughts within communication. One is the Wi-Fi standard 802.11p also known as DSRC, which really goes direct between those vehicles. It's a Wi-Fi standard, and therefore since it's 802.11 standard, it goes about 300 uh, feet or so. The other thing is through cellular, that you then connect to a centralized server, which also comes with different um, challenges and, and opportunities because of different communication standard. And um, the question is, do you need both? The good thing about a cellular standard is that it's already available. Whereas the 802.11p standard that needs to be implemented, it's not readily available. So the, the verdict is, 
is still out there uh, and, and one doesn't really know, but without any connectivity at all, I, I have a hard time seeing it. So is GPS connect connectivity? Um, I mean, I, 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 will not, I will not call it that for these purposes because it's a one-way communication. Okay. So, I mean, it's just really about communication between vehicles, whether that's direct between vehicles or through a centralized infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's like two deaths per year. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I'm not trying to. I'm surprised it was only totally two, limited. sadly right. enough. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, more than two. <laughs> yeah, probably, sadly enough. Yeah. yeah. But look, so, I mean, and, and this is why, why maybe some of you are very surprised how, how slow the adaption curve is that I showed. But all of this we have to figure out. And therefore, we need to start small, and we'll start small which we now see as, as pilot programs that, that are very, very important, whether that's what, what Google Waymo is doing or what Uber is doing or, or Tesla plowing forward with their level two, maybe soon level three automation. And from all of this, we are learning. And then you can read those things. Our algorithm can now identify bicycles, which is great. But, but what about now someone on a, on, a, on a small scooter or something like this? Does it identify this as a pedestrian or as someone on a scooter who can actually go 15 or 20 miles per hour on an electric scooter? Are there any, speaking of your S curves going up, are there any projections for the projected number of computer caused fatalities from driving per year? Yeah, not, not that I know. So you mean for automated vehicles? For automated vehicles yeah. yeah. No, and, and, and this is where I, I said those who say the number of accidents will basically go down by the same number that we have human error today, that that's wrong because those incidents will happen, as you say, computer errors, whether that's really a calculation error or a sensor error or a communication error, um, there's, there's no calculation for this. It will be much, much lower, obviously, than... So I guess the Tesla accident would be number one. Um, I disagree that, that yeah, Let, let's see, I mean, the, the, the Tesla accident, so the one in, in May last year in Florida, a tragic incident, I would call this a human error because it's a level two system. It seems like that the driver behaved at this as if it's at least a level three, if not a level four system because the driver was supposed to monitor and I assume I was not there, but I assume it was clear that this was a truck. There was not legally so, but in the end, turning in front of the vehicle, so it's human error. Had, had it been a level three system, and this is what I meant earlier, if you put out a level three system where you then can say, it's okay to do other things, you don't have to monitor, then it would be a computer. Yeah, we can make yeah. excuses, but all of this is going to be litigated. Like if the Tesla, if the Harris of the Tesla driver decided to sue, it's not clear they wouldn't win. That's true. That's true. And, and this, this is also where I said uh, the legality is one thing, but, but in the end, what, what we see in the legal system, it typically goes after the deepest pockets. And that you will probably always find a lawyer who supports this cause against a car company. And, and try to, to get um, some money out of it and to actually say, has ever been, everything been done to avoid this situation? And then, well, we, we've seen those cases quite a few times, uh, whether that was more recently with ignition switches or with floor mats or accelerator paddles, something like this, where you see, well, at least some of the examples that I just said, were not an obvious design flaw. It was maybe not the best design possible. But in the end, it then becomes something. And same thing can happen for an autonomous car or partially automated vehicle that um, those companies get sued and, and therefore that this will slow down also the implementation. And this is typically where we see that for the automotive industry, because they've lived through all of this in, in quite a few cases, uh, the glass is typically half empty more on the pessimist side and on the more hesitant side to deploy these technologies. Whereas the newcomers, and I would put Tesla in those as well, the glasses have full because they say, works well enough and we can actually update the software 
through um, software over the air updates. So let's release it and we make it better as we learn more. Yeah, but but it's, it's unclear. The aerospace industry has gotten very comfortable with the yeah. idea that there will be no progress without the glass of light. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been well documented in all the people who are looking for it. Amongst the auto manufacturers, do you see that kind of recognition that there are going to be some cost pushing the frontier? Or do you see mm -hmm. a serious reticence that they're not willing to kind of cross that threshold? Yeah. Um, I, I see more reluctance. Uh, with the automotive industry than I see maybe in the, in the aircraft industry. The question is if we are comparing this really on the same level, because obviously we have many more casualties, especially per mile uh, in automobiles than we have on, on, on airplane travel. At, what's that? <laughs> well, basically, yes, and, and it's actually a situation, all of us have flown into San Francisco, and maybe some of us are sitting at the window, as I typically do, and you basically get into San Francisco, and you basically have two planes approaching at the same time, but this would be now a situation where this plane says, you know what, I'm in front of you, never happens, but this is what happens in, in, in automobile traffic every minute or second, basically, and, and to your question, um, it, it, it just is a different setting in the, in the airplane or, or airline aircraft industry that you're really dealing with professionals at all times. They are not always behaving professionally, but if they don't, they are out. Whereas here we are dealing with lay people, with people who, like, I definitely include me, who are not always up to the 100% of their driving skills. I do confess, I've looked at my cell phone while driving. I shouldn't be doing it. I assume the pilots are doing this when they shouldn't be doing it. But you, you get the point. It's obviously a very different environment where if a pilot does it and something happens, it's out. Whereas as a, as a human driver, it's like, well, yeah, there was something. And, and, and also that uh, the, um, in the airline industry, there's a much closer relationship between the operators, the manufacturers, and also the component suppliers of um, the vehicle, mainly the aerial vehicle. So that means if something needs to be updated on the vehicle, on an airplane, that typically happens, but a recall uh, from a car is, is very different. Obviously helps a lot if the software with the air updates and something like this, but it's much more dispersed. And so therefore, I, I have a hard time um, seeing similar behaviors between um, airline and, and automobile industries. Uh, also, looking at time, we are, I think, almost getting to, to overtime. So what I do want to do is uh, jump a few pages here and, and basically just, no, actually, I wanted to do this. I'm not sure why this ended up here. Because this is what I wanted to show regarding the communication as well and why I think communication is necessary. So what, what you see here uh, on the logarithmic scale, what things can happen and at what time frame they are unfolding before encounter of the vehicle. In an hour or at least quite a few minutes, the weather changes. It starts to rain, it gets cold and icy. And then there's traffic that can build up a little bit faster than weather, but it also takes some time. There's a ball game tonight and therefore there will be bad traffic maybe. Trajectory, which is basically the curvature of the road, you can predict uh, maybe a second up to a minute into the future that you get on a mountain road and there will be a lot of zigzag switchbacks and whatnot. Stationary objects that the car recognizes a second, maybe 10 seconds in advance and it knows there's a dumpster, it will not move, it will still be there when I get there in three seconds. And then there's moving objects that can really move and shift just like this. And sensors are absolutely necessary, obviously, here. And this is what they are very good at, that they see, well, there's something like 10 feet in front of the car, and it's a solid object. We have to avoid it. But to really understand what is the overall setting with weather, with traffic, and maybe even with uh, the trajectory where you see there's a lot of switchbacks, and actually behind like the third hairpin turn, there's a vehicle stalled. That would be something that is hard to measure really with sensors, but it might help a lot actually to inform the vehicle to say, well, this is something how we should adapt. And you might say, well, we don't have this as human drivers today, but we do get information from, from traffic. 
uh, that you see this on, on your map that's in the car, that it's turning from green to yellow to, to red or, or, or other things. It definitely makes traffic much, much safer uh, if, if you have this available. And this is really where I would say that especially for those things that change on a longer term basis, not as frequently, but that you should really have information available to make um, traffic safer, that for this you probably need communication and you need sensors for the, for the very near term. And this is why I really think that in a way that the connectivity aspect is the missing link, the missing context for the autonomous vehicle. And also that the autonomous vehicle is in a way the killer application uh, that's, that's needed for the connected vehicle, which would be yet again a different subject. Just to, just to come to the end, I'm, I'm going to jump through, through all of this here, but I did want to, to leave this maybe as, as a summary, uh, like 13 points where we think this, this could happen. It, it's for one, autonomous driving will happen and soon, but really in, in different, different flavors. So not like you can buy the supercar and it gets you here from Stanford campus to San Jose uh, with a push of a button. Uh, You're welcome to give Dennis, by the way, a cleaned up version of your slides. You don't put it on the website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Thanks. And, and, and then, um, what do we have here? Uh, that autonomous driving will be introduced in, in developed countries and uh, probably in advanced cities, which actually goes with the investment that, um, that is necessary for infrastructure, but also the driving patterns that, that you have in those settings that lend themselves more uh, than in other situations. We, we have not talked too much about commercial vehicles, number three. We looked at trucks at some point, but for all these reasons where we said it's really for professional drivers and it's a lot about the cost of ownership that um, commercial vehicles might be at the forefront. And also we saw the tech players might leapfrog level three, maybe level, well, level four automation, probably not, but for sure level three automation and just jump to uh, like a self-driving car in a confined space. Um, for, the, for the OEMs, so the vehicle manufacturers, the, the BMWs, Mercedes, Lexus of the world, it's expected that for them it's like a really premium feature that um, autonomous driving might come first there. Taking us to uh, what is actually necessary to, to get this right or to win the race to, toward that. Um, really, number six, figure out what one wants to do. And, and you see quite a bit that this is the autonomous car. Really figure out, is it something more like the extension of public transportation? So like the little mobility pods that operate uh, in one city, or is it something that one wants to look at the highway, more a consumer um, driven vehicle? A software and artificial intelligence uh, fields a very benign saying it in this building, but this is really what the industry needs. A lot of the skill set, a lot of the talent in, in programming, in learning algorithm, but really merge this with the existing algorithms that the automotive industry has to drive the car. And this is really where we see quite a battle is maybe too strong of a word, but, but, but definitely a lot of discussion. Can you rely only on artificial intelligence or what sort of uh, like, like rule-based or traditional control a loss should, should you have for those vehicles. Um, okay, an, an ecosystem is, is basically that you need to build around infrastructure and such as well. And number nine, uh, infrastructure and the HD maps that we discussed, um, that there is belief that this is definitely necessary. And then number 10, um, the Chinese way of autonomous driving might be quite interesting as well to basically regulate, okay, this is what we want and we might keep all other vehicles out for reasons that we discussed, um, the human-driven vehicles might not mix very well. Number 11, this will probably transform um, mobility in general, especially together with electric and shared vehicles. We looked at shared vehicles. I did not talk too much about electric, but this is really a new way of driving, a new way of getting around. And um, also number 12, that's probably the more the consulting jargon, the disruption, so that this will really shake up the industry big time. And uh, so therefore, number 13, it's not just an opportunity for the companies that are doing this, but also for cities to change how traffic happens in the cities. It is unclear if this will really make traffic so much more enjoyable than it is today, because we might actually create more traffic, because if we make it easier to be in a car, as we don't need to drive ourselves anymore, we might end up with even more vehicles. So also there, the verdict is out. 
uh, when and to what extent things are going to happen. But obviously a lot of questions that need to be answered, which is why we say probably in the next 20 to 30 years we will see a lot, but it will come in different stages and maybe in different pockets and areas as we might expect. We're running long. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction and for having me here at WE380 and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about a topic that's very dear to my heart, for one, the automobile, and second, um, the autonomous car, and, and also third, to do this here at Stanford University, which maybe some of you saw from my bio that was shared in advance of, of this class. I used to run the Center for Automotive Research here on Stanford campus. I still hold a lecturer appointment at the business school. But uh, relax, I will not bore you with all the business jargon and business frameworks and the likes. But I want to share with you a few thoughts on how actually these autonomous vehicles might or might not actually take shape. And therefore, I really want to look at technology business, consumer, and also policy considerations because uh, not everything that we can do, we are allowed to do, or maybe we should not do. And therefore, it's, it's really my, my message, basically, when I, when I teach classes, that while technology is great, one also needs to consider business, consumer, policy, and actually environmental considerations as well. And, and so therefore, I, I, I brought a mix. Uh, you also see there uh, the last uh, or the lowest um, line in or as my title. Um, I'm also a consultant at McKinsey, uh, the um, management consulting firm. So what I'm sharing here with you today is actually business uh, consulting uh, information. And so therefore, there might be a little bit of jargon in there, uh, but I, I really selected uh, this material that I thought might fit equally well in other disciplines as well. So therefore, it's great to be here in EE CS engineering in general and talk about autonomous driving. Are we there yet? And, and the way how I um, really like to, to begin a talk like this is with this picture that I've or that I used to show quite a bit when, when I uh, started the Center for Automotive Research here at Stanford in um, ME actually in 2009 and we had a class uh, dedicated to autonomous driving. Sebastian Thrun was there lecturing as well which was really a treat. Uh, Chris Ermsen also came to class to lecture and um, I was showing them this picture because it's actually from a book that my parents bought. Thanks, because mm -hmm. I got one when I had a Volkswagen Rabbit. Yeah. And they yeah. were the first yeah. to offer passengers. So it's, it's, it's basically, and I'm a mechanical engineer, it's fair to say that the mechanical engineers probably did a great job making vehicles safer. But in, in the end, it's something that now we are compensating that things got safer and that it got so much smoother in the car that we start texting and maybe playing Pokemon Go and all of these things that we are distracted. And therefore, those numbers go up again. Stability control was about 20 years after the seatbelt law. Mm -hmm. And with the seatbelts, they saved a lot of people from hitting the dashboard mm -hmm. and impaling themselves, and those deaths went down almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So the point being? No, that was the point. He was right on the money over there. Well, yes, but it's not just about seatbelts, because even after the seatbelts were introduced, still they kept going down. I propose right. that the speaker continue for the Yeah, yes. thanks. So, so, so much about, about safety and, and the number there that says um, that through autonomous driving that we can maybe reduce those numbers by 90%, which is not quite accurate because that actually assumes that we can avoid all accidents. What is true is that we can reduce a huge number of accidents, whether that's about 90% or whatever it might be. The problem, however, is there might be new types of accidents as well, which is that now there's computer programming errors that there's maybe something like the laser scanner was not cleaned uh, before the, the drive started and all of those things. So basically it's the number of accidents will go down but also the profile of accidents might shift. Number two is the time that is, that is freed up. Now that we don't need to drive anymore we can do other things. And, and that is really a huge driver because especially during commute 
people just don't enjoy the driving and are really happy if they can do other things, so if they free up the time. Number three, mobility of non-drivers. So that's really the bookenders of the society, if you will. For one, it's really the younger generation, uh, where you say those who are not legally allowed to drive, they can use this in a way as a means of transportation. Or if they are allowed to drive, if they have a driver's permit, maybe this technology or hopefully this technology can help them become better drivers because the vehicle watches out for them, which then obviously becomes a symbiosis, a companionship between the vehicle and the driver, which is the same actually at the other end of the spectrum, so therefore the book enders. So the, the aging population that is maybe not entirely comfortable with driving, but still driving uh, is part of an active lifestyle, so that therefore they actually get support first thought. Around the time when I was born, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and it was a book about the future. It was about what the future might be, and in the early 70s the future was, of course, the year 2000. And um, so this is what the idea was in the year uh, 1970, something like this. Um, autonomous cars. Back then it was much more about automated highways than today's autonomous car, so it was relying much, much more on infrastructure than actually the self-contained laser scanner, radar, camera, deep learning, and, and all of those things within the car. But the idea was the same. Well, we will have cars to drive themselves, and we can actually enjoy the time in the vehicle, doing other things than driving, have a drink, uh, watch TV, uh, they hadn't quite figured out that we wouldn't stick to a 4 by 3 screen, so they, they were not thinking about 16 by 9 which tells us also something, that things in the uh, consumer electronics industry change much, much faster than things in the automotive industry, because here we are. This book basically was printed uh, or published when I was born. Whether I like it or not, I'm somewhat midpoint in my life, I guess. We still don't have it, so it makes me hopeful that there's still a lot for me to see, expect, and explore in the second part of my life. And, um, and, and also what this picture shows, again, it, it's more about automation um, of the highway, and, and therefore this car is actually not driving across the, the center line uh, between the lanes. It's actually a magnetic strip, which they had envisioned back then as a guidance system uh, for those vehicles, which you can basically today replace with GPS, because back then they didn't have GPS. It was in the early stages in the 1970s. But today it's basically something like you know where you are on a road through GPS. Uh, but, but also what this picture shows, it's an idealistic representation of what traffic is because that is something that everyone basically is in an autonomous or automated vehicle. They all seem to be following those red dashed lines. But now think about it, if this red car, they are basically in front of uh, our three friends who are enjoying a gin and tonic or something like this, which you then can do while driving. Um, imagine this red car is actually human, driven by a human, and it's on 101, and it's maybe me, it's like, ooh, this is the exit to get to campus and I basically swerve over. Well, first of all, those glasses will no longer be on this little table, but it also tells us actually a lot what the difficulty is in the vehicle, and in the end, also the vehicle can drive themselves. So where we say, number three, mobility to, to non-drivers or those who otherwise might not have access to mobility. Number four, reduction in cost. is on the one hand that the cost per mile might actually go down, especially for mobility services, and I will take a look at this a little bit later. So this is about Uber. If Uber um, operates self-driving vehicles, it's expected that the cost will be cut in half. And, and then um, number five, the benefits for society, where we actually see on, on the one hand congestion really contributes negatively to the GDP in, in a large way, 2 to 4 percent in, in some large cities we basically see is going wasted because people are stuck in traffic. Or some other numbers that are typically or often populated are that the average commuter in the United States loses about 36 hours every year, so almost one entire work week because traffic is not as efficient as it, as it could be. And so therefore, um, if we can do something about this, for one, you gain your, your time, then you can do other things, but also society and economies in general 
benefit from it. Other than that, uh, under society and, and ecological cost savings, it's about accidents. On the one hand, that's definitely a society benefit, but also for the um, ecolog ecological um, aspects where you say uh, now the traffic is smoother, that you can reduce actually the uh, energy demand for transportation because vehicles are operated uh, more efficiently. So there's a lot of motivation actually to do this. And again, those motivations haven't really changed that much maybe over the last 40 to 50 years. But now this seems to be accelerating. And, and here we basically take a look at like four um, stakeholders in um, autonomous driving, starting from the left. It's really that consumer acceptance is something that we now see growing where people say, yeah, I really want something like this. You see some of the research that we did in, in consulting where you say 79% of consumers who are interviewed would actually choose an autonomous car, especially if it's no extra cost. And you might say, well, duh, that's easy. If it doesn't cost me anything, why would I not do it? But that also implies a different way of driving that you are not in control anymore. And we really have a lot of considerations also in terms of trust. And if you, if you feel comfortable in an autonomous car, if you actually want this, but we see now an increasing number that consumers say, no, that is something actually that I do want to have. Also knowing that it's what we are trying to accomplish here, meaning trying to accomplish a world of self-driving cars, but we need to deal with the current system which is what I like to call a somehow working chaos, meaning somehow traffic works out. Uh, but if we now mix autonomous vehicles to it, that should actually follow the rules at all times because it's a vehicle manufacturer who says, this is how I define driving. So therefore, it doesn't really mix too well with us humans cutting corners, literally or figuratively, here and there. And, and therefore, those cars don't really know what to expect. And, and that's, in the end, what, what I really want to explore a little bit more here over the next hour. So the last part of the, of the tagline there, how real is all of it? And basically, what can we expect when um, and, and how might it unfold? But before we go there, maybe a little bit more about the motivation for autonomous vehicles. And, and that basically, I, well, I was way too young then, but one could have shown uh, back in the 1970s um, it's in the end about, about safety, about saving time. It's um, providing mobility to those who don't have mobility today. Reduction of cost always uh, might help as well. And then also what's in it for the greater good of, of society. And, and really personal safety, uh, that also translates actually to the point number five, uh, the interest of society. Today we have 40,000 people killed in traffic accidents in the United States last year. And that's a number that's going up. That's sadly so. It used to be when I was giving similar talks like three, four years ago, this number was 34,000 people killed. Still way too many. But now it's going up from 34,000 to 40,000 people killed. Yes, but before that, though, the, the number was about 50,000 people. True. It was compared to the number of casualties suffered by the US in the Vietnam War. True. And what caused the 10,000 drop mm -hmm. was the seatbelt law, the requirement to wear seatbelts. Part of it? Which was, no, that was the major portion. Yeah, no, no, well, I mean, it was a huge uh, driver in it, but, but also, for instance, the electronic stability control. So the people or the vehicles cannot spin out anymore. That also saved a lot of lives. And then also incremental change, such as tire pressure monitoring. Also, I will say safer roads really making sure that guardrails don't really stick out of the ground like this and motorcycle drivers really get uh, pinched by them. But definitely seatbelts and airbags have also had passive to. Restraints. I mean, there were actually passive restraints before airbags.